Good evening, everybody. Welcome. What a wonderful evening we are in store for this evening here. Um, thank you so much for all being here. I'm Jennifer LaRue. I host these public programs uh, virtually on behalf of the Mark Twain House and Museum. And I'm so tickled to be hosting tonight's, which I have a deep personal interest in, as well as a professional one as your host. Uh, and boy, I love the chat. You all are really being friendly and letting us know where you're from, telling us about your wonderful cats. Please continue to do that throughout the program tonight. We are, of course, welcoming Dr. Paul Kudinaris, uh, and talking about his book, A Cat's Tale, I'll introduce him more thoroughly in just a moment. I just have a little bit of housekeeping to do before uh, I bring him up and say hello. So yes, please continue chatting away in the chat. That's part of the fun of these uh, virtual programs. And know that this uh, is being recorded and you'll be able to come back and watch it anytime you like simply by following the same Crowdcast link that you used to get here in the first place. And one of the fun things is the chat remains live in perpetuity. So you can come back if you've made a friend or if your cat has made a friend, uh, you can continue to communicate through the chat right here. However, we're going to do a Q&A, audience Q&A, toward the end of the program. Um, and if you have an, a question for Paul, uh, rather than put it in the chat where it might be hard for us to locate, um, could you please put it in the ask a question section that you see at the bottom of your screen? It looks like there's already one question there. Um, so that will make things a lot easier when we get to that portion. Um, I also want to let you know that, that Paul is going to be sharing a PowerPoint presentation that is um, close to an hour, maybe a little over an hour. So usually our programs last just an hour. This one might go over a little bit. Um, and we, he has said that he'll stick around as long as you need him to to answer your questions. So just be aware of that. While you're looking at the bottom of the screen, if I could ask you to uh, take a moment to look at that long green bar that says, your support is vital. Click here to donate to the Mark Twain House and Museum. Uh, that is the truth. Your support is vital. Uh, the museum has been very proud to offer these virtual programs, sometimes as many as three or four a week since the pandemic began. And we have attracted a large and loyal following from people like yourselves from all across the world. And um, it's been a great, great fun, a wonderful journey, but it's not been free. Now, most of the time the museum does not charge admission for these or registration fee, but um, th these programs are not free to, to mount. So if you have enjoyed them over the past two years or any portion thereof, or if this is your first one and you want to show your support, uh, just uh, I want you to know that on behalf of the museum, its staff and board of trustees, every single penny that you're able to share or spare is put to very, very good use indeed, and uh, is very deeply appreciated. I'll be reposting this again, so it's more visible in the chat, easier for you to get to, but at the very, very top of the chat, there's uh, uh, information about how you can order your very own potographed copy of this book that we're talking about tonight, A Cat's Tale, A Journey Through Feline History, it is just beautiful. I mean, it is such a fun and informative book. I, I love it. Um, and it is written by Baba the Cat uh, and as dictated to Paul Kudnaris, who will be speaking on Baba's behalf this evening. So when you order that book, we'll be sending them out in the next few days. They are going to be uh, autographed and potographed. Um, and it'll take a few days for those to get out from our museum store. But do know that first of all, if you do purchase through that link, uh, you are uh, getting a signed copy, which you don't get everywhere. And Jennifer in our audience says, it's a great book, um, but you also know that your purchase supports the museum. So thank you in advance for making that decision. I don't think you'll regret it. Uh, before I introduce Paul, I'd like to thank our sponsors. As always, tonight's program is sponsored by the Wish You Well Foundation and by Connecticut Public WNPR. And it's produced in part with support honoring the legacy of Frank Lord, who was a much beloved uh, trustee of the museum who passed away last year. We miss him and are really great, uh, grateful to be able to honor his memory uh, with these programs. If you like this program and want more, please visit the museum's website, marktwainhouse.org, uh, and check out the upcoming virtual programs. And the museum is beginning to offer some in-person programs. If you are in the vicinity and able to get to Hartford, um, there are a lot of exciting things coming down the road. So please check those out as well. 
Now, having said all that, I would like to introduce Dr. Paul Kudinaras. He's an author and photographer with a PhD in art history. He's written three award-winning books about the visual culture of death, and he's also a feline scholar who's lectured in Europe, the United States, and Australia on the history of cats. His book, A Cat's Tale, written in the voice of his rescue cat, Baba, presents feline history from a feline point of view. Baba is also an internationally known feline cosplay model who has appeared in newspapers and magazines throughout the world and models the looks of the historical periods and famous characters she narrates in the book. Uh, so without any further ado, give me just a moment to bring Paul up on screen and join me in giving a great big Mark Twain House welcome to Dr. Paul Kudinaris. Welcome, Paul. Hello, Jennifer. Thank you. And uh, if you can see me on screen, this cat I'm wrestling with is not Baba. This is Baba's brother, Walter, who's filling in for her for the moment as she's currently taking her nap. But hopefully she'll be along. Oh, and there he goes. Hopefully she'll be along shortly. Um, when I was asked to do this talk by the Mark Twain House, they said, hey, do you think it's possible to do a, a cat lecture for Twain House? And I said, well, I think it's super possible because Mark Twain happens to already be in the book talk, thanks to this wonderful quote from him. If a man could be crossed with a cat, it would improve the man and deteriorate the cat. And we'll hear more from Mark Twain as we go along. I think Mark Twain would approve of tonight's topic. I call this talk, America, a History of Cats. But it's not so much about nationality, since cats themselves, they don't really care about national borders and maps. To me, an American cat is more of an attitude, and it just happens to be an attitude. As I was writing the book and researching the history of our nation's cats, it just happens to be an attitude that defines who they are. An American cat to me is not some purebred, expensive, fancy cat in a penthouse eating off a silver plate. The true all-American primo cat is a stray. It's the kind of cat that's born under the stairs or in a warehouse. The kind of cats who scrape by on whatever scraps they can find at first in the beginning of their lives, yet somehow, despite every seeming disadvantage, they all seem to have this attitude, this confidence that the entire world is theirs. They're as condescending, as stubborn and willful as could possibly be, yet somehow when these cats decide to take you as a friend, never, never will a better or more loyal friend will you ever have. That to me is an American cat. And if you're to say, <clears throat> well, sir, isn't that just kind of all cats in general? I'll say no not in the proportions that ours are. And I'm going to explain how and why they evolved the way they did tonight. To understand American cats, though, to understand our cats, we need to first understand who they are and where they came from in the first place. Because let's start out with this. There were no cats, no domestic cats in the Americas before Europeans arrived. They're immigrants. They were all imports. They all came from a very nasty old world where they were not liked. They were held up high in the pagan world, but of course anything the pagans held up high was cast down very low by the Christians. And that included cats, which had been venerated in many pagan cultures. Christians associated them with the devil, with death, with witchcraft, they were considered nasty animals. You know, we nowadays think of the devil as a big nasty goat. Back in the day, back in the medieval period, you looked at those old demonological tracks and they described the devil as a big black cat. Cats were really not a well-liked animal. And honestly, they would have been exterminated in Europe had they not had one incredibly useful ability, their ability to catch rodents was the only thing that really gave them currency in European society. But that ability to catch rodents also made them passengers on ships. No ship would sail without a crew of cats on it. Whether they were the devil or not, 
every sailor wanted a cat around, and that was because those big, creaky wooden ships invited rats and mice in, and those rats and mice could easily prey on sailors' stores. So all ships had cats, and the age of exploration, because of all, because all ships had cats, also be kind of, it kind of became an age of liberation for Europe's felines. They got off of that nasty continent where they were discriminated against, and they started to settle in other parts of the world because they were on those ships with those sailors, and they were also on those ships that brought settlers to North America. Puritans and, as we'll call them, Puritans. All the ships coming to the Americas had cats to protect their stores, but a lot of those ships were only making one-way passages, passages, which means that when the settlers got off, those cats got off as well to found their own feline states of America. So understand the cats that first came to this country were strong, rough cats, strong enough and adaptable enough to, to survive a very difficult sea voyage, experienced feline mariners, who were also adaptable enough to survive in a completely new, strange, and foreign world. Of course, being a cat in the Americas was different than being a cat in Europe. It wasn't all that great of a shake, however. They were still considered an odd animal and not a great animal, but the people who settled the east coast of the United States were different than the people they left back in Europe. In Europe. They were hardworking Protestants who were less interested in big bonfires and shows of deviltry, maybe Salem set aside. They were less interested in stuff like that than they were in finding the utility, utility value in things. And there was a utility value in cats. Remember, they had the ability to catch rodents, and the American settlers prized that. And they started to overlook those old superstitions that held the cats as servants of the devil and started to look at them a little bit more as comrades in this new world, in this new venture. There was an old saying in the American colonies, you will always be lucky if you can make friends with strange cats. And what they meant by strange wasn't weird or bizarre cats. What they meant were cats unknown to you. Strange cats meaning strangers, meaning in our terms, strays. You will always be lucky if you are friendly with stray cats. And they tried to cultivate a good relationship with the stray cats because the stray cats would come along and patrol their farmland for rats and mice. They invented something. We're seeing it on the screen. We now call it the cat door. It was invented by American colonists who wanted to give stray cats access to their barns so they could go in and hunt down rats and mice. It's funny because in Europe, in England, they claim that the cat door was invented by Isaac Newton as if you had to be a genius in physics in order to understand a flap through a little door that would allow an animal to pass through. Not so. It was, in fact, invented by American farmers to give access to stray cats. Again, the Americans were more interested in looking for the utility value in things than big shows of deviltry, so they overlooked the past, and even the government, when the country was founded, started to take cats on the payroll. What I mean by that, here's an old press clipping from the 1890s, it talks about government cats, and for instance, it mentions the United States Post Office, which at the time had a budget of $1,000 a year for cat's meat. Now, why is the United States Post Office hiring cats? Well, it's because of the mail, which was, back in the day, housed in warehouses and in bags that mice and rats could easily get in and they could chew the mail. The cats were there to prevent right, mice and rats and other kinds of rodents from chewing on the letters that you sent and making sure the mail was safe. And the money was apportioned to post offices along the East Coast depending on size. Of that $1,000 for cat's meat, 100 went to New York, 10 went to Philadelphia, and so forth. And you may say, well, $1,000 a year isn't that much for the postal cats, is it? No, it's not. But remember, the cats were supposed to be kind of 
providing their own dinners, right, by killing all these mice and rats. And the money kicked in when the cats had done such a good job that there were no longer any mice and rats to kill. Much better pay if you were a cat came from the United States Army because the United States Army had them too. Here's an interesting tidbit for you. Interesting piece of historical trivia. We think of, when we think of military animals, we think especially of dogs, right? The dogs of war. Guess what? The United States did not have a military dog service until after World War I. When we entered World War I, we had to borrow dogs from the British and the French, but we had cats in the army since the beginning of the country. And the reason why cats were on the payroll, same thing, to protect the storehouses from mice and rats. Here's an old press clipping. The army allows $18.25 a year for each of its cats. These cats are provided for all commissary storehouses. They save the government much more than they cost. Yes, we want beef to feed cats, said Colonel Sullivan. The cats are in the service of the government just the same as I am, and they receive just as much attention, and the same formalities are gone through in purchasing their subsistence stores, which happens to consist of one pound of fresh beef a day. Every cat in the army was budgeted one pound of beef a day to make sure that it was well fed and could continue doing its job hunting down mice and rats. Now, being an army cat, if you were in the United States, was serious business. Um, here is perhaps the greatest, uh, the greatest order ever issued by the United States Army. Army cats had better start obeying the regulations or they'll be sorry. Cats not in quarters between 7.30 p.m. and 6.30 a.m. at Fort J. Governor's Island will be kicked right out of the Army and into the SPCA pound, the commanding officer ordered. Being an Army cat was serious business. As I said, you were a utilitarian animal, and you were a soldier, and you were expected to be disciplined. Most cats obviously couldn't hack it but some of them actually made a great name for themselves. The most famous cat in the United States Army in the 19th century, in fact, the highest ranking cat the United States Army ever had was named the Colonel, and he served at the Presidio in San Francisco in the 1890s. His, his rank was Colonel, and his name was Colonel as well. So he was technically Colonel Colonel. He... Um, he was titularly in charge of all the United States Army cats, although whether he ever tried to issue an order to the, to the entire body of Army cats and whether they obeyed it, I think is unlikely, and I have to say I don't know, but he served during the period of the Spanish-American War, as I said, at the Presidio in San Francisco. He was their leading cat, and he was considered the greatest mouser the United States Army had ever had. In fact, he was such a great mouser that, remember, the Spanish-American War, it's when we captured the Philippines from the Spanish. So we had our first Pacific territories. And United States soldiers go to the Philippines and they find out they've got a really big problem because the Philippines have some rats that are bigger and meaner than they had ever seen in the United States. And they said, the Filipino cats can't deal with these rats. We're in trouble. They're destroying our storehouses. A special envoy was sent to San Francisco to take four of the colonel's own kittens all the way across the Pacific to the Philippines and apparently try to teach the Filipino cats American army methods of mouse and rat catching. Well, so there was a place in the United States and there had always been from the beginning four cats. As I said, they were not considered pets. We didn't live with them as family members as we now do, but there was a place for them in American society in a way there had never been in Europe. That being said, as I said, as I mentioned, they weren't living with us as pets, it was kind of like the American settlers through the 18th and the 19th centuries knew there must be something more with cats that we could do. 
There must be some greater purpose for them other than just being utilitarian animals, catching mice in, in storehouses. So they, it, they were looking for them. It's a, it was a characteristically and curiously American thing in the 19th century to have articles in newspapers suggesting new uses for cats. It's as if the American people knew there was something more with cats. We just weren't finding it. They just didn't bother to think. It's like, hey, Maybe they can just be our pets, our family members, and our friends, just like dogs can. It was just too simple an answer. So they gravitated towards some very complicated answers. Here is one of those newspaper articles I mentioned. In the New York Times in 1885, a man by the name of Mr. Tyndall mentioned that he may have found some of the missing uses for cats that we have been overlooking. He mentioned that the elasticity of the cat is one-tenth less than India rubber. So they're a highly elastic animal. So he mentioned chair cushions as, as good options for using for the use of cats. Buffers on railway cars. What he mentioned is that the kind of bumper that they had on railway cars was, was very expensive and prone to damage. So he, he suggested a kind of bumper made of cats that each car could have so they would kind of just bounce off of each other, apparently, as he said. He believed cats were very much like rubber. And the best use he came up with with cats, he said, for fire companies. Yes, he says each fire company should have half a dozen cats to be used for the purpose of rescuing people from high buildings. If you're wondering what he's getting at, if you've ever seen those old movies where there's a skyscraper on fire or a big building in New York and there are people standing underneath with a trampoline, firemen with a trampoline, for people to jump on and be rescued, he said if you could just get the cats to kind of marshal themselves underneath where the burning building was, the people could just kind of jump onto the cats and bounce off and therefore be saved since he believed cats to have such incredible elasticity. Another guy in 1881, another article, um, proposed using cats to, pr to protect buildings from lightning. Few people, if asked what is the cat good for, would return any intelligent and serious answer, but it was reserved for an American scientific person in the present year of grace to discover that cats may be of inestimable value in protecting buildings from lightning and that this is undoubtedly the true object of the cat's existence. His name was Professor Schmidt, and he was from the University of West Virginia. He said it is as well established as any scientific fact can be that the cat enjoys a unique and total immunity from lightning. I mean, okay, we all know that, right? Here was his reasoning. He said that when lightning comes down, it hits the tops of buildings and sets them on fire, but it very rarely hits the back fences of houses. The reason he said, now I think the reason it hits the top of the building and doesn't hit the back fence is the top of the building happens to be higher than the fence. Okay, that's simple enough to me, but Professor Schmidt decided it was because cats usually crowded around back fences and alleyways, and he thought the cats were somehow imbuing the back fences with this protection of lightning, and he came up with, he came up with an actual algebraic formula for the amount of lightning protection that a cat could give. Uh, X being the amount of protection equals the square root of three times the cat's length, including the tail. So don't use a Manx cat if you're protecting your house from lightning. Anyway, he concluded three cats and a small kitten arranged at equal intervals from one another are amply, su are amply sufficient to protect the back fence of any ordinary city lot from lightning. So you could just put them in your attic and voila, better than any lightning rod you could ever possibly have. Well, again, Americans were looking for a use for the cat. They just couldn't come up with the simplest answer, the answer we have today, that they are pets and, and valued members of our families. They just couldn't come up with that. It was too simple. So these cats were still utilitarian animals through the 19th century. And it just still wasn't that great a place to be a cat. You know, you're a working animal. It, through the 19th century, aside from the colonel, who had earned some degree of fame in the army, there were only three well-known cats in the United States, three who had really made it. And two of them were dead. One of them was a cat who had jumped from the Washington Monument. He had climbed all the way to the very top, and there's a window up there. 
And he got locked in and he jumped from the top of the Washington Monument and he actually survived the fall. People saw him jump from the top of the Washington Monument. He had injured himself, but was limping away. And as he was limping away, he was set upon by a dog who killed him. And it was such a strange newspaper story that his body was taken to the Smithsonian and stuffed and put on display. So he had some public prominence, although not in a way any cat would ever want. The second cat who had some public prominence was named Anubis, and he was the official mummy of the Milwaukee Press Club. Yes, you're reading that correctly. Back in the day, when, when journalism was really something, you know, an honorable profession, they would have these strange parades where they would wear clothes, where they would wear mm, outfits kind of like the Odd Fellows Lodge. They'd wear these big dramatic robes. And in Milwaukee, they would walk around with a mummified cat on a stick to, you know, obviously express the, the, the joys and virtues of journalism. This cat had been found inside a wall of a building in Madison and brought to Milwaukee as the press club's mascot. He is still there in Milwaukee today, actually. He, there, is a, there is a bar in Milwaukee that the newspapermen frequent. Uh, and you can see he's got a little shrine and he's surrounded by um, he's surrounded by an iconography of things involving old school journalism. You know, the, the ink pot and the pen, um, the scissors and the paste for making layouts. So he had kind of made it and was well known, although, again, he was dead. And there was only one other who really had any public profile. His name was Toots Willard. Toots was short for Tootsie, his first name, and he was considered to be the cat who kept America sober. Toots Willard was owned by a group of prohibitionists. They were trying to get America off the booze. And one way they had to do this was to travel around with this cat and sell postcards of this big white cat as a fundraiser in order to, to make money for the prohibition campaigns. It was said that Toots Willard, the cat, hated drunks, and Toots Willard was fully in with this prohibition campaign, and it was kind of like at the time, since cats weren't pets, it was kind of like showing up at the county fair with a raccoon or badger as your mascot animal and selling little pictures of it. So as I said, 19th century, cats were accepted with a place in American society, but it was not a place within our hearts. Um, and they decided, the cats decided in the 19th century to do what all other misfits looking for a place would do. Back in the 19th century, everybody did what? Who was looking for a new place and a new identity? They headed west. The cats headed west, sometimes with those carts and caravans, sometimes on their own, simply following human towns that sprung up along the trade routes, the cats started heading west too, where they would truly make their name in this existential society where old identities from the East Coast were lost and new identities were established out on the frontier. The cats actually had an incredibly important, here's Walter's back for us, the cats had an incredibly important role in the Wild West. The reason for that, it's again because they could catch rats and mice, but there weren't a lot of cats in the West. The only cats in the West were ones who had migrated from the East Coast or a few who had come up from Mexico, and they were highly in demand. For instance, in the 1880s, in the Arizona Territory, the fixed price for a cat, any cat, was 10 U.S. dollars. That's a lot of money at the time. Why was a cat, any cat at all, why was a cat so incredibly valuable? Well, like I say, it was scarcity. There weren't that many. If you were a rancher and you wanted a cat, a farm cat, to protect your farm from rats and mice, you needed to pay this price because there just weren't a lot around. And cowboys wanted them too. This has kind of been left out of the Western movies. Maybe it would seem the cow, maybe it would make the cowboys seem not quite as butch, but cowboys would often ride around with cats and they would sometimes they would have little place for them on the horse in front of their saddle. Why would a cowboy travel around with a cat? 
The reason is, let's say the cowboy is going to be out in the field for a very long time, and he just has a bag full of supplies, and he needs these supplies for his survival for a month or more. If field mice get into that bag, they could leave him starving. The cat's going to prevent that. So cats started to interact with people on a completely different level on the West Coast. Truly, they were in demand on the frontier. Here's an article from 1889. An enterprising guy was paying 50 cents to a dollar for stray cats. Any cat at all, he'd pay you 50 cents to a dollar, depending on size. And then he was sending them to the Dakotas. He was, send, he was sending train books. Uh, train cars full to the Dakotas where they were being sold for three dollars each. They were truly in demand on the frontier. And as I said, they had a very important role in Western history. People started be to live with them and to rely on them on a one-to-one -one basis in a way they never had on the East Coast. And they started to understand them as members of the household. They started to understand their virtues and they started to understand just how strong and smart these animals are. Like I said, it was an existential world out there Old identities were lost and new identities were established. Some of these cats really proved themselves in the West, made names for themselves. An incredible story about a cat in Salt Lake City. Now, this cat by the name of Tom, we assume he's a big male tomcat by that name, he belonged to a guy by the name of John West. Now, Tom and John West got into an argument over a flounder. Tom thought the fish should be his, and Mr. West thought it was his. Mr. West, being the bigger and stronger of the two, decided he was tired of Tom stealing his fish, and he grabbed this cat, his cat, he put it into a bag and threw it onto a passing train. This train traveled all the way from Salt Lake City to Caliente, Nevada. That's 337 miles away before the, the conductor on the train noticed a bag that had some strange mewing noises coming from it. When they arrived at the station in Caliente, they opened that bag, found the cat in the bag, a cat without a ticket, I might add, and put him off as he wasn't a rightful passenger. What did Tom the cat do? Tom looked at those railroad tracks and he knew somewhere back there was Salt Lake City, his house, Mr. West, and his damned fish, and he started walking. 337 miles later, he winds up back at his home, back at the front door, proving himself the stronger of the two, and Mr. West took him back in, gave him that fish, and vowed to never put him out again. Like I said, these cats proved themselves on the West Coast, proved themselves not just as mousers, but as legitimate members of a household, sometimes in dramatic means, as in the story of Tom and Mr. West. Another, another fascinating story about frontier cats from a man named Cy Warman. Now, Cy Warman worked on the railroads, but he was also a poet, and they sometimes called him the Bard of the Rockies or the Bard of the Railroads. And he himself had taken a cat when he worked for the Western Line. He had taken in a big black female cat, and he had traveled all around the frontier on the train with this cat as a railroad worker. When he decided to retire from the railroad service and move back east, he figured, well, I better go get my cat. She's become a part of my life. She's served with me, and I'm gonna, certainly going to take her back. He went to get that cat, and he found that big black girl sleeping on the coal stack of the train. He walked towards her, and the cat turned towards him. You know, cats always know when something's up. They have that intuition and it's unfailing and they always know when their people are leaving. And this cat knew and she turned and she looked at him because she knew that he was leaving and she started to walk towards him as if she was gonna come. And then imagine the drama, a pregnant pause, the cat stops. She looks at Mr. Warman, her human, then lets out a pitiful meow, turns, and walks away back to the coal stack. This cat had been chosen by a person, but she didn't choose him back. Instead, she chose 
that train, as I said, the West the frontier was an existential place where identities were established and her identity was as the railroad cat. She continued to serve on that train, even without Warman. She traveled that train up and down the line for several more years until there was an accident. That train was found having, having skipped the line and fallen over. The conductor was found dead. And near his body, near his broken and crumpled body, was found the broken and crumpled body of that big, fine, black cat that Mr. Warman had thought was his. She lived and died as she wished, as the world's only railroad cat. There was really something about these cats out in the existential West. They were proving themselves and making a name for themselves. Back to Mr. Twain. You know, we're used to this idea in the United States of, of, of ideas and culture, in, intellectual ideas traveling from east to west. But with cats, it was the exact opposite. The ideas involving cats as members of our lives and members of our households instead developed out on the frontier where the cats themselves had established it living with us and traveled back to the east as if to tell, as if the west coast, as if the frontier was telling those people back east, hey, remember that thing with the cats you were talking about and wondering about and thinking, I don't know, maybe they're good for lightning or trampolines for people jumping out of buildings? We figured it out out here on the frontier. They could just live with us and be our friends. And they're incredible animals. And the East Coast started to get turned on by this idea in the late 19th century. Back to Mr. Twain, as I said, if a man could be crossed with a cat, it would improve the man, but deteriorate the cat. The first great champions of cats on the East Coast included not just Mark Twain, but several other artists and writers. The artists and writers on the East Coast picked up on that news first. They started looking at cats and taking cats as an alternative to dogs. Dogs are great, don't get me wrong, but a cat could be something more. It could be a confidant. It could be a muse in a way that a dog never could. A cat just doesn't give up its secrets so easily as a dog, and it, they had a kind of romance to them once you took them in and started learning about them and living with them, these mysterious creatures that we had overlooked for so long. Another great champion of cats from New England. New England really becomes ground zero for cat veneration in the United States. H.P. Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft, another New England author. This is his famous quote. The cat is for the man who appreciates beauty as the one living force in a blind and purposeless universe. As I said, it was the artists and the authors who first took them in, and they started taking them in in mass. I read an old advice column once uh, from, from around 1900 for, for people who want to become cultured. They wanted to become artists and they wanted to become writers. And it said, hey, you want to become an artist? Bit, bit of advice. Get yourself a cat. It was considered a standard artist's tool. You should have a cat. Cats loved by famous authors, artists, musicians, and his, in history. The great Samuel Butler always claimed that the test of literary excellence was not whether a man could write an inscription, but whether he could name a kitten. Antonio Sashini, the Italian composer, wrote operas with his favorite cat sitting on his shoulder, and Henry James, the writer, worked the same way. You know what? Henry James did not write with cats sitting on his shoulders. It didn't matter. It became kind of the lineage of the cat, that they were part of an artistic and cultured life. If you were really a cultivated person, you should get yourself a cat. It's like it says, it starts in the 1890s, with these artists artists and writers uh, adopting cats as pets, and it starts to spill over into popular culture as it kind of always does. You know, the avant-garde, the artists and the writers set the trends and everyone picks up on them. And by, 19, by, the, by around 1900, it, the age of the cat had truly dawned in the United States. Here's a new term for you. The, the first term for cat care in the United States was called pussyology. The science of pussyology, it didn't last long because it had some 
uh, shall we say, awkward connotations, but the first cat care pamphlets in the United States were pussyology books. They were filled with absolute nonsense, but, but having cats as pets was so new that no one really knew anything about them. Here's from one of the pussyology pamphlets. It talks about cat feeding. Cats should be fed regularly and at least twice a day. Okay, that I think we can all agree on, but what about this? Bread and milk or oatmeal porridge and milk, the milk having a little hot water and a trifle of sugar added to it in chilly weather. That was good cat food at the time. There was this guy who was arrested in New York for, he was brought up on charges by uh, the local Humane Society, by the SPCA, because it said that he had performed an act of animal cruelty on his cat because he had recently adopted a cat and he was gone for two weeks and a whole he left the cat to eat were peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. As I said, people who really didn't understand cats at the time. So the SPCA takes this guy to court on a charge of animal cruelty and um, and in his defense, he said, hey, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are good for anybody. And the judge agreed with him. He let, the judge let him off only with a warning. And the warning was, next time if you leave for a couple weeks, make sure you unwrap the sandwiches because the cat can't eat them through the cellophane or paper. As I said, it was all very new and very weird. But it was happening very, very quickly especially in New England. As I said, New England is ground zero for cats in the United States. That's where it really first hits the big time. This grave marker from 1910, it is the most stolen photograph I've ever taken. So it certainly has that distinction, um, but it has another distinction as well. First of all, let's read that inscription. In quotes, he was only a cat, obviously sarcastic, but he was human enough to be a great comfort in hours of loneliness and pain. And look at the year 1910. As I said, it's that first decade of the 20th century, around 1900 starts then, when people really start taking in cats. The historical apart, uh, importance of this gravestone aside from the touching inscription, well, it's in New England. It's at the um, the Pet Cemetery in Dedham, which was for the Animal Welfare League in Boston. That was their cemetery. And this gravestone becomes the first public monument, the first gravestone to ever publicly proclaim love for a cat, truly a historical monument in the United States, the first public monument proclaiming affection for a cat. Like I said, New England, ground zero. They started the first newspaper column dedicated to cats in the Boston Post. It was called the Famous Cats of New England column. And every week or every month, it was a, it was a periodic column. Every time they found one that they thought was really deserving, they would run a little story. And they would tell you about a great cat in New England who had did something really, really incredible. Some of these stories really are touching to this day. The first, like I said, the first newspaper column ever dedicated to cats, famous cats in New England. One of the cats named Minnie won the award twice. They gave it to her twice. Why? Well, they gave it to her twice because she died and came back to life. It was quite a story. Now, she had been burned in a fire. Her charred body was found by firemen from company number 24, ladder company 24, and they put her on the back of the truck in order to dispose of her body later. Well, it was still sitting on the back of the truck the next day, and they started to hear it making noises, faint mewing noises, and they realized that burned cat was still alive. These firemen nursed that cat back to health, and eventually it made a miraculous recovery. Its fur all grew back, and it became fully ambulatory again. And that fire company, Ladder Company 24, adopted her as their mascot. Now, that may not seem like a big deal to you, but hold on a second. Old fire companies, old fire trucks... We expect them to have a dog, and in particular, of course, the stereotype is a Dalmatian. Those firemen are running around the East Coast with Dalmatians on the back of their truck, but not Ladder Company 24. They took a cat, and that cat became famous, Minnie the Fire Cat of Ladder Company 24. Another cat, number 21 in the series, named Bozy, 
won the award because he worked at the Macaulay Hat Company and he liked to hide in paper bags. Now, some of you may be saying, as I said when I first read this, um, wait a minute, all cats like to hide in paper bags. Why are you giving that cat an award for that? Well, as I said, <laughs> humans living with cats was quite new and somehow this idea that the cat was in the bag was quite exceptional at the time. So they give this cat the award make him a famous cat of New England because he likes to hide in bags, something every cat likes to do. And only later on in the article, when you get to, towards the end, do they mention this. Oh, his peculiar habits also include running across the room, upright on his hind legs, while trying to catch flies with his forepaws. This wasn't exceptional. The, the, the thing that was exceptional was hiding in the bag. Well, this, obviously, is something that a cat should win an award for. That is extremely peculiar, but as I said, we really just didn't understand them. Living with cats was that new in the early 20th century. It was so new that apparently they still had a little bit of a bad reputation. One of the famous cats of New England, cat number 23 named Tabby, he won the award because it said in the article, in 12 years, Never a single thing had he has he stolen. In other words, they still had they still had a little bit of a stigma. If cats are expected to be such natural thieves, that we're going to give a cat an award for not stealing things. Anyway, as I said, it was something entirely new. But New England was gravitating towards it, and then New York did too. In fact, the first true celebrity cat. And I will call him the most important cat in American history, and I believe that to be true. This is not a photo of him. There is no surviving photo. It's just a photo of a random cat wearing glasses. But his name was Jerry Fox, and he was the official Brooklyn Borough cat. Yes, Brooklyn, as a borough, took their own mascot cat. That alone is big news because cats, as I said, were utilitarian animals, but they were not friends with humanity. They were not animals that we took in. Brooklyn took an official borough cat by the name of Jerry Fox, and that cat was a celebrity in part because he himself did wear glasses. I'm going to show you some uh, press clippings regarding Jerry Fox. It's very, I think, illuminating in terms of cats in American life, but also in terms of why I call Jerry Fox the most important cat in American history. This is from, this is, uh, from his obituary, which was run over several columns on the front page of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle when he died. What were identified as the remains of Jerry Fox, Brooklyn's famous official cat, were exhumed by strange-tongued subway workers at the Borough Hall shaft, Brooklyn, yesterday morning. Had each of the several hundred city office holders, judges, lawyers, volunteer firemen, war veterans, and businessmen in Borough Hall Square lost an old college chum, there could not have been sorrow more profound than that which greeted the news of the death of Jerry. So he was truly loved, and we know it from this newspaper article. But then you go on and you read this. And the language that they sell, that, that the language that they use, and what they have to say about Jerry becomes very interesting. Jerry was an epic in himself, said Assemblyman Burns recently. In an earlier day, he would have been to Brooklyn as the codfish is to Boston. All further down in the article, endowed with a cheerful and fearless disposition, he early made friends with the old anti-Brooklyn Bridge officials who used to saunter in easy fashion around the old city hall. They liked the cat because of his pugilistic qualities and frank manners. And further on, it might be said of him, nil nisi bonum, of course, that he had no political principles and that he was the friend of whichever party was in power and like the vicar of Bray, did not jujitsu his conscience just so long as he got fat, fat contracts at lunchtime. And I mentioned the thing about his spectacles. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize what all this means to me as a feline historian in a moment. I mentioned the thing about his spectacles, his glasses. He did wear them. His sight went back on him, the article continues. And it says, with his spectacles, there came to Jerry a certain quaint dignity and pride in his afflictions. He sat by the hour with his glasses on his nose. On sunny afternoons, friends gave him a newspaper, and he sat around the hall among the bums, and like the best of them, 
pretended he was reading because apparently those bums aren't reading the newspaper either. He got so that he could not do without his glasses. When he hadn't them, he went ambling about the square like an old man, ruminating over his salad days and stumbling on the trolley tracks until every motorman on the line got to know him and stopped when he hove in sight. The reason this is all so important, and the reason I call Jerry Fox the most important cat in American history is this. You look through these quotes and what they're saying about him in this obituary, it doesn't sound like they're talking about a cat or an animal at all, and they're really not, because Jerry had become a symbol. Jerry was the first cat to cross the line and become a persona. He was a symbol of Brooklyn him itself. He was a personality rather than a cat. He had descended, he was descended, he had transcended being a feline and became, what did he become? He became a celebrity, a celebrated personality, something more than any cat and something more than he truly was. He was a symbol of all of Brooklyn. As I said, in terms of cats truly making their way and making it in America, that's why I call him the most American cat, the most important cat in American history. He becomes the first cat to transcend simply being an animal and becoming a presence, becoming a celebrity. How did he actually die? It's funny, he actually died because of his glasses. Apparently he went out without his glasses one day and fell into a hole. They did not realize he was there. They were working on a water main. They closed the hole up and tragically he died down there. But it was said that on the day his body was discovered and it was confirmed that he was dead, April 6, 1905. Remember in the beginning of that article, all those people, who were so shocked and saddened by the story of his death, by hearing that it was true. It was said that on that day, April 6, 1905, all of Brooklyn wept a tear. All of Brooklyn wept a tear for a cat, for an animal that 20 years before had been nothing. Keeping a cat would have been as weird as keeping an opossum or a raccoon. They were good for the army and protecting storehouses, but they weren't good enough to live with us as pets, as intimate companions. On April 6, 1905, that age officially ended because all of Brooklyn wept a tear for the first cat who had transcended being a, simply an animal and become a symbol of the entire borough. That's why I call him the most important cat in American history. Well, America's first celebrity cat had died, but another one was rising over the horizon soon after, and literally so. The first airship to ever try to cross the Atlantic was called the Airship America. It was a very, uh, it was a very ill-fated and ill-advised venture. Remember, the most sophisticated airship ever, the Hindenburg, doesn't quite make it across the Atlantic either. And this was almost three decades before, in 1910. The first airship to ever try to cross the Atlantic was the Airship America. And um, they brought on board a cat. Why did they bring a cat on board the airship to cross the Atlantic? Well, remember I said that cats had a long history on sailing ships. And the first aircraft crew happened to be sailors who were taught to work on a dirigible aircraft. And so they thought for good luck, since they were used to sailing with cats, they should sail through the air with one as well. And his name was Kiddo. So he becomes the first flying cat, the first airship cat. Now they're going to try to fly across the Atlantic. It's not going to work, but they're going to crash by Bermuda. But they tried, and when this ship went up, no cat had flown before, certainly not in a dirigible aircraft. And this cat, Kiddo, didn't like it. He started, they said, mewing, howling, and rushing around like a squirrel in a cage. He was running all over that undercarriage because he did not like being airborne. There is the thing that made this cat famous was this, because I said he's the, the next celebrity cat is literally rising over the horizon in 1910. The thing that made him so famous was this, not just that he flew. 
It was because the Airship America was the first flighted craft to ever carry a radio unit. Now think about that. That's historically important, right? That's an historically important bit of trivia. The first flighted craft to ever carry a radio unit is going up. And as they're going up, the captain picks up the microphone and in his gruff captain voice, he's going to say something over the radio. What is the historic first radio message ever sent from the air? It is, Roy, come and get this goddamn cat because he's running all over the place. So when this ship crashes, which it does, when this ship crashes, there's kind of ignominy for everybody and humiliation for the crew and the people who backed this venture, but not for the cat. It's not his fault that these humans were so stupid that they were going to try to tri fly this ship over the Atlantic and wound up crashing by Bermuda and they had to be rescued by the Coast Guard. And as the press tends to do, they try to look for good within the bad. As I said, they the crew and the people who backed the venture were humiliated, but it's not the fault of the cat. So they pulled that cat out as the silver lining of the story. Hey, the ship crashed, but guess what? There was a flying cat. Isn't that something? And not only did the cat fly, that cat was the subject of the first radio message sent from the air. Wow, that's something for sure. And so that cat becomes a celebrity and starts doing tours. When Gimbel's department store in New York City opened, the most most prestigious department store in the country at a time, their big draw to bring people in was that cat. Kiddo was going to be there. He was all the way on the top floor, surrounded by wreckage from the Airship America, and you had to walk through the entire store in order to get to the top and the back in order to see, there it is, the treasure of treasures, the flying cat who, the stu who through the stupidity of human beings, wound up crashing in the Atlantic. He goes to Pittsburgh. He goes to Pittsburgh where he's going to be the guest of honor at a cat club show. They give him a collar made of gold. They hand feed him chicken and what they called dainties for the duration of the show. This cat's a big deal. This is a press clipping from Anaconda, Montana. So I traced his tour all the way over the Rockies and all the way to Montana. Take a look at this. He was making $2,000 a week on tour in 1910 and 1911. That is a massive amount of money. Okay, that crashing sound in the background happened to be one of my cats knocking something over. He was making 2000 He's not getting $2,000 a week for knocking stuff down, people. Um, this cat... Kiddo was making $2,000 a week on tour in 1910. That is a massive amount of money. As I said, truly America's got another celebrity cat and a, a truly national celebrity, unlike Jerry Fox, who's only a celebrity in Brooklyn, a truly national celebrity. It really is the age of the cat by the end of that first decade of the 20th century. What happens to him? Well, things don't go too well for Kiddo either, as it turns out. A man by the name of Melvin Vanneman decides he is going to fly an airship across the Atlantic. His airship is called the Airship Akron, and he wants that cat. Here you can see, you can see a photo of him with Kiddo. Uh, you can see, as I said, Kiddo was being hand-fed chicken and dainties well, he's been eating a lot of dainties because there's more than one balloon in this story, if you see what I'm getting at by looking at his stomach. Well, Melvin Vanneman has his own ship. It's called the Airship Akron, and he wants that cat. He wants that cat because he wants to fly across the Atlantic, and he wants that cat on the crew. Why does Melvin Vanneman want that cat on the crew? Because this cat's a celebrity. And this cat's going to bring the press and it's going to bring backers because he's got this famous cat as part of his crew. So he's able to finagle this cat as a member of the crew. What do you think happens to the airship Akron? That's right, a literal cat catastrophe. Vanneman crashes his airship in the, Akron, in the Atlantic as well. And this time it's not just the crew that dies that poor cat will die as well. America had its second celebrity cat and its second celebrity cat had died, also a tragic death. But what had started was absolutely unstoppable because by this time, 
it's going to hit Hollywood. Because by 1910 and 1911, they start looking for cats for the silver screen. Now, the traditional, the traditional ideology in Hollywood was forget it with cats. They said, no, they're not trainable. They're just, they're just too stubborn to work in films. Dogs, good. Use the dogs. Use the horses. Those are good, dependable animals. Cats can't do it. But there was a cat about to prove them wrong. Her name is Pepper, and she becomes America's third celebrity cat, and she becomes its first movie star. Pepper... Pepper was born under the soundstage of Max Sennett Studios. This is so early in Hollywood history that the studios weren't even in Hollywood. Max Sennett Studios was in the Echo Park District of Los Angeles in 1912, and a kitten was born under the soundstage, a dark gray colored little kitten, adorable little girl. Like I said, the standard idea in Hollywood was cats can't do it, Forget it. They cannot act. They cannot be trained for the screen. Well, this little kitten happens to worm her way up through the boards, the floorboards of the sound stage, and pop up on stage one day. And they're looking at this kitten. And someone says, look at that thing. It looks so at home here. Look at that little girl. Hey, turn a light on her. So they turned one of those big hot lamps on her. Didn't flinch. Didn't mind at all. Someone said, hey, roll some film. What do you think? They look at this film, and by God, if any star has ever... Oh, here's another one of my cats. Her name's Pig. Say hello, Pig, to the people at the Twain house. They roll film, and what do you think? Yeah, this cat's got it. They said that cats couldn't function on a movie set. Well, this cat was perfectly at home, this little girl. You can watch this. <laughs> you can watch this loop. It's only about a second long, yet you can watch it forever because it's just intoxicating. Pepper, this little girl, was about to prove them wrong. She could function on set, and she could take directions, and she soon becomes a regular in Senate productions, playing alongside Charlie Chaplin, Fatty Arbuckle, the Keystone Cops, the biggest stars of the silver screen, and she's there alongside of them. And within a year, she had gotten her own starring role. She becomes the first cat ever to get a credited role in a film, and her own starring role in a short film called The Little Hero, working alongside a dog by the name of Teddy the Wonder Dog, who was the biggest canine star of the day, who was also owned by Senate, and offstage was her best buddy. This is even earlier than Rin Tin Tin. This is very early Hollywood. I'm going to show you a, a little clip from A Little Hero, and you can see Pepper in action. This is not the first part of the film. The first part of the film involves a woman. Remember, this is a short first part of the film involves a woman who owns both a cat and a bird. And she's going to leave the house and she tells the cat, she gives the cat specific instructions, do not try to kill the bird. Well, Teddy the Wonder Dog has looked through the window and decided there's a big problem. That cat's not going to cooperate. See, the little hero is not the cat. The little hero is the dog. The cat's actually the villain. Pepper uh, Pepper's going to try to get that bird. It's going to be trouble. And... Teddy the Wonder Dog is running for help. We've got to save that bird. There's a mean old cat in there, and it's going to try to kill that bird. Now, that bird's in big trouble, right? Here goes Teddy. Teddy was apparently too big a coward to deal with that little kitten himself, so he's out looking for more dogs. There, there's some dogs. Come on, Teddy. Help, tell him. Help, help. By the way, this, this isn't Dutch. The only... Uh, the only copy I was able to find was a Dutch copy. I was not able to find an English copy. It's a silent movie, obviously. So this is dog language that Teddy's doing. And now they understand. That's that's apparently dog sign language for help. So here come the big dogs, because it's going to be trouble. Here comes the cavalry, right? There they are. And it's bad for the bird, but they're going to get there and save her. And we're going to cut it there, because it doesn't turn out well for the cat. But as I said, it offstage, it turned out great for the cat because she was the first feline movie star. 17 credited roles in her life and many more uncredited. Interesting end to her career. On screen, she and Teddy always played rivals, cat versus dog. Off screen, they were best friends. After Teddy died, 
Pepper the cat went into a period of mourning and refused to ever act again. She would not act without her buddy, the dog, and her career ended then, but it had opened up another chapter in the American house cat, that of movie star. Well, by this time, right, the first decade in the, the, the 19 teens, by this time, cats were obviously had in a very short portion of time wound up as part of the American fabric. They were part of America now, and they were going to go to war and fight for it. Here is another interesting piece of trivia for you that you may not have ever guessed. America's cats deploy to Europe in World War I before America's hum human soldiers. World War I was the first time American soldiers had ever set boots in Europe. It was the first time America had ever gone to war on the European continent. But the first American troops were feline, not human. Our cats beat our human soldiers there by about a month. How did that happen and why? Well, remember I told you there are some peculiarities about American cats, and they're all descended from those old ship cats, because that's where they all came from. That those were their great, 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 great grandfathers. And they were known as ship cats. The original American cats were big and tough and bred to kill mice and rats. And they still had it. When we declare war on Germany, on the Axis in World War I, the British will come to us and they will say, yeah, while you're getting ready to join the fight, we have a favor to ask of you. We need your cats because there are rats in the trenches on the Western Front who are so big and so mean and so awful that our whatever tea drinking cultured British cats just can't deal with them. They can't fight them. We need dock cats from New York, Philadelphia and Boston, because your cats are famous the world over in those ports for being the toughest ratters that exist. And so a, a shipload of cats was sent off to war and set loose in the trenches to battle those mean Kaiser's rats that were running around and bugging the British. American cats deployed before American humans. They continued to fight for democracy and liberty. The weirdest story I think I've ever found involving a cat came from World War II, bomber to tote black cat across the path of Hitler. Before we entered World War II, the Dallas Chamber of Commerce sent an all black cat named Captain Midnight to the RAF with the idea that it would fly on an RAF bomber crisscrossing Europe until it had crossed Hitler's path and thereby cursed him and uh, caused the Germans to lose. And I don't know if you want to believe in these superstitions about black cats, but who knows? Maybe that's why the Germans capitulated before the Japanese. Maybe they, maybe Captain Midnight finally got his man. But I said that cats had come to the United States on sailing ships. That's where they came from because they weren't native. Well, they continued to serve on those sailing ships and they continued to serve with the United States Navy. Here in the United States Navy and as we see here, the United States Coast Guard, World War II, again, the cats in service. Uh, their paws defending democracy. Here is the uh, ID card of Herman the cat, the Coast Guard's cat in the port, in the port of Baltimore. Um, occupation, expert mouser. And here's his paw print because we don't want any of those nasty Nazi cats sneaking into the Baltimore port. Another bit of trivia for you. These cats did really serve and it wasn't always a joke like it was with Herman's ID card. The most decorated World War II animal, think about this, interesting, was not a big war dog. The most decorated World War II veteran animal with three service ribbon, ribbons and four battle stars from the United States Navy was a cat. Her name was Pooley. She was born in Honolulu, Hawaii. She served in the Battle of the Pacific, winning seven commendations from the United States Navy. The Battle of the Pacific, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, some of the fiercest naval battles in history, Mariana's Trench. She was at all of them. And after the war, explaining this picture, 
after the war, she also not only becomes a much decorated animal in the war, she is very valued after the war as a kind of celebrity herself because she becomes the late, longest surviving service animal from the war. All the dogs have died. All the other animals who served in World War II had died. She was the last one standing. And so every year for her birthday, she would put on her uniform to, to show that she hadn't gotten, you know, fattened out of shape after being out of the service. She'd put on her uniform to show she still had it. She still had the physique. And that thing that's on the chair in front of her, that was a telegram from the Pentagon. The Pentagon every year after all the other animals had died and it was only her would send her a telegram on her birthday and congratulate her for being the last surviving World War II animal and thank her for her service on behalf of her country. Cats were also serving with the police. You know, we think again of the police dogs, but did you know police units have also often had cats? The LAPD, the Los Angeles Police Department, had a cat by the name of Battling Tom. Battling Tom was the Valley Division um, police cat in the 1940s. You can see him here getting getting patched up by an ambulance driver after a run-in with a suspect. The story here, well... The LAPD had brought in a crook. They had brought in a thief, but they weren't minding the store. And the bad guy got away. He slipped out the door because the police didn't even see him go. But guess who saw him go? Battling Tom the cat. Battling Tom was the one who took off after him down the street. Battling Tom, the long claw of justice, is the one who jumped on his back, scratched him up, and gave him a good fight before the police were able to drag him down and bring him back. By the 1950s, cats had entered a new era in American society with the introduction of an award called the Puss in Boots Medal, and I happen to have an actual Puss in Boots Medal in my hand, which becomes in the 1950s something like the Feline Nobel Prize. And it was invented because of the incredible saga of a cat by the name of Clementine Jones. Clementine Jones lived in Dunkirk, New York, with her family. Her family was named the Lundmarks. Now, the Lundmarks, Mr. Lundmark, had gotten a job in Aurora, Colorado. So they were going to move the family to a, to a town near Denver, but they decided not to take their cat, Clementine. Now, they weren't abandoning Clementine. The problem is Clementine, this was 1949 when they moved, Clementine was pregnant at the time, and they decided, oh, you know, it's not, it's not really very humane to move to drive this pregnant cat across the country. We're going to leave her with our relatives here, and Clementine can just be their cat. She'll, she can have her kittens back here in New York, and she'll, she'll remain a New York cat. She'll have a good home and a good family back here. So they decide to move to Colorado. Fast forward several months, the kittens are on their born and they're on their own by now. By now it's 1950. And Clementine decided she didn't like that arrangement very much. I'm sure the family back in Dunkirk was very nice, but she wanted to be with the Lundkirks wherever they were. And she disappears. She is gone for four months. Word comes to the Lundmarks in Denver, you know, something bad has happened to Clementine. We don't know what. She's lost or she's run away. She was probably hit by a car. We're terribly, terribly sorry to inform you of this, but we haven't seen her. And we're, we're terribly sorry about poor, poor Clementine. Well, poor, poor Clementine wasn't lost and she wasn't run over by a car. She was out somewhere on that big, vast map between New York State and Colorado finding her way, think about this, finding her way over 1,600 miles to a state she had never been in, a town she had never been in, a house she had never in her life seen, but she found them. Four months later, Clementine Jones shows up at her family's new home, even though she had never been there. She had tracked down the Lundmark family. This gets written up in the papers, and people are saying, wow, that's an incredible story. Someone should give that cat a medal. And in California, there was a pet food company by the name of Puss in Boots, and they marketed cat food under that name, Puss in Boots. And they said, uh, here's an idea. 
Let's be the one. We'll give her the medal. That's true. Someone should give her a medal. We'll do it. And they mint a medal called the Puss in Boots Bronze Award, and they send it to that cat in Colorado. Give that cat a medal for this incredible thing that it's done. But not only that, they decide, hey, this is a great idea because cats are the up and comers in American life. They've proven themselves now in that first half of the 20th century, and they're going to be really big in the second half of the 20th century. Let's be part of it because we market cat food. Let's print a bunch of these medals, not just for Clementine Jones, but every time a cat does something great, we're going to send it a medal and it's going to make our cat food really well known because of the publicity of all these great cats. And so these medals start getting for the next 10 years until, until Quaker Oats buys out Puss in Boots cat food and sadly does not see the wisdom in continuing to print medals and distribute them to cats. Until that time, for the next decade, this becomes, like I said, kind of the Nobel Prize of feline America. These medals are given out to cats who do incredible things, and it helps to raise the profile of the American cat. Some of these stories really are incredible. For instance, here's one from Louisiana of a, a plantation cat, a plantation cat who sat outside the door of a house where a blind dog lived. Now, this cat was not originally owned by the family. This was a stray who had stopped his own wanderings in life, sensing an ailing creature in this house, and started to wait for this blind dog to make an appearance. And this cat, who becomes known as a seeing eye cat, starts to wander with this dog. The family will let the dog out in the cat's care, and this cat will wander with the dog around the plantation all around, make sure it crosses the street safely and make sure it gets home safely every night. The seeing eye cat, my, how the tables have been turned. So the seeing eye cat certainly deserves a medal, doesn't he? Well, and the story, in fact, is even more interesting than that because this cat does not want a home among humans, by the way. After the dog dies, that cat leaves the plantation and is never seen again. That cat stopped its own wanderings in life only to help this dog. He didn't really care about the people on that farm. Truly proved himself more humanitarian than most humans that I know. Other cats who win this award, one is the San Quentin Prison, uh, San Quentin, San Quentin Prison cat by the name of Chicky. The the inmates loved her so much, they made this little kitten a toy piano, her own bed, even her own little wooden car that she could manipulate with her feet and ride around the prison yard. She gets one of these medals with a note thanking her for brightening the lives of 2,000 people. A cat in Torrance, California gets one of these medals for running the local polling station. Yes, in the 1950s in Torrance, California, when you went to cast your vote, you checked in not with a human, but BB, the election cat. Another one of these cats by the name of Mama Sue in Joplin, Missouri, wins one of these medals because an opossum was killed by a car, yet that opossum had a crew of babies in its pouch, and those babies were still alive. This cat had just finished nursing its own kittens and will take those baby opossums, save them, and start nursing them as her own kittens and save their lives and raise them. So she is awarded one of these medals during Be Kind to Animals Week. The pet company says, as an example of the kind of harmony and love that can exist in the natural world that we as humans can take a lesson from. Well, as I said, Puss in Boots, may, their metal may have been discontinued by the 1960s thanks to Quaker Oats, but they were right. Cats were going to be a big deal in the second half of the 20th century. Cats were going to become even bigger than they had been during that first half, and they were going to become even bigger celebrities, some of them. Going back to Hollywood now for the biggest celebrity of all, his name was Orangey, and he becomes the greatest of movie cats. Remember, we had started with Pepper, the first cat to get a credited and starring role, but Pepper only had starring roles in shorts, those tiny little five or ten minute movies that would be shown before the main feature. Still, still, by 1950, no one had ever made a full-length cat feature. 
that will change with Orangey. You know him because of Breakfast at Tiffany's, but that was actually his last role. He is the Marlon Brando of Cats, and his story is an incredible saga, starting in 1950, when Paramount was looking at a property called the name, by the name of Rhubarb. Rhubarb was a kind of hokey film about... Um, a very wealthy guy who owned the Brooklyn Dodgers baseball team. He owns a professional baseball franchise. And when he dies, it is found in his will that he has given the baseball team away to a stray cat from the street. And this stray cat is now going to own a professional baseball team. Hokey weird story. And you can only make this movie if you can find a cat for the leading role. Paramount was looking for a cat. The problem was... All the animal trainers in Hollywood they talked to were bringing them cats that were too nice, like purebreds, really nice cats. And the people at Paramount said, no, this is the story of a gruff street cat who owns this baseball team, not a nice cat who eats from silver spoons. We need the right cat. And this project is on on the verge of being shelved, it's on the verge of being canceled, when out of desperation, they put an ad in the newspaper that says, wanted, bad-tempered, scarf, I'm sorry, bad-tempered, scar-faced, sourpuss of a cat for a leading role in a film. Well, they got their wish because in Sherman Oaks, California, a suburb of Los Angeles, a woman by the name of Agnes Murray had a big, mean, scar-faced, orange, come on. Oh, look, it's Baba, my co-author. Hello there. Out in Sherman Oaks, California, a suburb of Los Angeles, a woman by the name of, say hello, Baba, a woman by the name of Agnes Murray had a big, mean, scar-faced, sourpuss cat living under her bush. It was said that this guy was so nasty that no one could even touch him except Mrs. Murray. And she looks under that bush and she reads that ad. And she says, they want a big, mean, scar-faced, sourpuss cat? Oh, yeah, I've got one for them. He weighed 16 pounds. She wrestles him into a box, takes him down to Paramount and says, I've got a cat for you. And they say, yeah, that's a street cat. That's the cat for our movie. He winds up, this untrained cat winds up with the biggest contract given to an animal in Hollywood history. They buy him on the spot from Mrs. Murray. He is turned over to a very famous animal trainer by the name of Frank Inn. If you're not familiar with the name, you're familiar with some of the animals he's trained. He trained Higgins, who's the dog who played Benji. He trained the pig who played Arnold Ziffel on Green Acres. They turned this cat over to Frank Inn, and Frank Inn hated this cat. This cat was so mean that Frank Inn said that by the end of the film, his arms were unrecognizable from all the scratches. This cat hated people so much that they had to put fish paste under people's fingernails, the actors, so it would look like he was being nice to them, but he could do it. He was good in the film. The film itself bombed at the box office, but the cat, despite being so mean, like I said, he really is the Marlon Brando of cats. He's this very eccentric character in Hollywood history. Despite the cat being so mean, he was great on film. So the film flops, but the cat was a star. They used to have, back in the day, an award called the Patsy Award. It was the it was the Oscars for animals, and they would have this um, every year. They would have this uh, award ceremony at the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, and Ronald Reagan, the future president, used to host it because he had been in Bedtime for Bonzo with a chimp, so he was known in animal films. So Ronald Reagan would host this show where they would give out the award for the best animal actors of the year, and they would give all the tickets away to orphans local orphans so they could come and have this free day and see their favorite favorite Hollywood animals on on the stage it sounds like a great event and he becomes all the awards all the acting awards had been given to dogs or horses other or mules you know Francis the talking mule things like that all the awards had always been given to dogs and horses until 1952 the year after rhubarb comes out 
when it is given for the first time to a cat, they were trying to make an animal walk of fame like the Hollywood walk of fame. This is his plaque with his paw prints in cement, becomes the first animal to ever win an acting award, first, I'm sorry, first cat to ever win an animal acting award, and then will follow that up a decade later by becoming the only animal to ever win a second Patsy Award for Breakfast at Tiffany's. And between then, Orangey has an incredibly long career of major and minor roles in films and television shows. When he was receiving the second Patsy Award for Breakfast at Tiffany's, here he is, by the way, in Bewitched, a show I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, he was so difficult to deal with. That, that one studio executive called him the meanest cat who ever lived. He would get in fights and hiss at directors. Sometimes he would run off set and they'd have to bring bloodhounds in to find him again. But he was magic when you got him on camera. In other words, he was a perfect Hollywood personality. I guess we could say it that way. Um, when, in, when a decade later, when he's going to receive his second Patsy Award, the first animal and only animal to ever win two, Someone interviewed Frank Ann and said, how many roles has this cat had? And his response was, I don't remember. I stopped counting at 300. And by the way, Frank Ann, who hated him at first, well, you know how it is at cat with cats. Eventually, Frank Ann loved him. What happened to this cat in the end after he retired? After he retired and died, Breakfast at Tiffany's was his last role. Frank Ann had him cremated, the cat that he hated at first. He had him cremated, saved the ashes, and when he died, he had his friends put that bag of ashes into his suit pocket, and he was buried with that cat's ashes in his coffin in Hollywood Hills Forest Lawn. They are buried together there. The cat that he hated turned out to be his best friend in life. As I said, that's just sometimes the way how it is. That's sometimes how it is with cats. One of the all-time animal box office champions and buried at Forest Lawn Hollywood Hills. Well, we've come quite a ways in our story of America's cats. I only want to talk about one more cat because I know we have to end this soon. By the way, here is, I will show you this, a potographed, potographed photo of Orangey himself. Um, there's only one more cat that I want to talk about, but I want to talk about this cat last because to me, he is the quintessence of the American cat. Remember, I defined what I thought an American cat should be, should be considered. You know, these strays who have, who come from nothing. They've certainly got an attitude. And in the end, when they decide they like you, never will a better friend ever be found. No cat really represents that story for me more than a simple school cat from Los Angeles, California, the Echo Park District of Los Angeles, California, Legion Heights Elementary, by the name of Roommate. To me, he is the quintessence of American cats. His story sums it up better than any I have ever heard. He showed up at the school in 1952, this elementary school, when the school was up through the sixth grade, K through six. Well, the kids were out at recess, and he sneak. He was a stray. He was about maybe four years old at the time. He sneaks into the sixth grade classroom. Uh, the room was room number eight, hence his name. And while they're at recess, he runs around and starts eating through everyone's lunch. He was a homeless cat just out looking for a meal. The students come back in, and they're pretty pissed off because this cat's been spoiling their lunches. They were mad, but... Somehow something happened in that moment. Instead of chasing the cat out, they looked at that cat as and they just formed this instant bond. The students did. They looked at that cat and all their anger dissipated and was replaced by love. And that cat looked at those kids and he had decided in his four years of life and wandering and stealing things and doing whatever stray cats do, this is exactly what he was looking for and what he wanted. He decided he loved these children. It was an instant bond. The children said, uh, well, teacher, can he stay? And the teacher said, well, 
it's kind of against the rules, but I guess we can allow it if he stays just temporarily. The teacher obviously knew what she was seeing in the bond, the sudden and instant bond between the kids and this cat. <clears throat> temporarily turned out to be 16 years, the rest of his earthly life. He was named Room 8, as I said, because he first appeared in Room 8. He will appear in every school photo for the next 16 years. The thing about this cat that's so extraordinary, as I said, in strays tend to be very stubborn. It's a real characteristic of our American cats. They tend to be stubborn and willful. He wanted one thing. He wanted those kids. He didn't want a home among men. He didn't want a home among us. He didn't want a home among humans. He remained a stray. His home really simply was the school. His home was in the heart of those children. Every day when those children left the school, he didn't go home with one of them and live there. He just went back off into the hills. He did his thing. He didn't want to be among us. He lived at night. Now, on the weekend, he lived wherever he wanted at night. He did whatever he wanted on the weekend. Yet every morning and every Monday, he'd show up back at class when school started again. During the summer, the school was locked up. But during, and who knows what he would do? He would just wander off. After all, he was astray, but he showed up without fail every fall. It becomes like Groundhog Day for, for Los Angeles. Every year, at the beginning of the school year, every fall, the newspapers would send a reporter down because, the, the you know, year after year, this starts becoming more and more an incredible story. And so the newspapers would send a reporter down, kind of like Groundhog Day. Okay, it's the first day of school. We're at Elysian Heights Elementary. Is that crazy cat going to show up for school again this year? And he never disappointed them. He always did. That's what he wanted and where he wanted to be, this determined and willful cat who had found meaning in his life through children and the children through him had found love. It becomes this kind of rite of passage in Los Angeles. Every year he comes back, he becomes officially the greatest flunky in the history of the Los Angeles Unified School District, yet in his case, nobody seems to mind. Their love for him was such that when a new library opened, his portrait was placed in it, his picture was printed on the school book plates, there's a giant mural of him eventually on the outside of the school, and his paw prints were set like a celebrity in concrete in the sidewalk. Eventually, as his story is spread, it was told in magazines, not just in Los Angeles, but around the country, he starts getting fan letters from people all around the country just saying how wonderful it is that he continues to be the Los Angeles school cat. He receives thousands of letters throughout his lifetime, and the students themselves, who love him so much and he loves them back, will gladly act as his correspondents reading his mail and responding. Eventually, he becomes famous enough that a book about him is written during his lifetime. It's written by one of the teachers and one of the school principal. They write a book, an illustrated book, telling his story to an even wider audience, a children's book. Um, he eventually inspires a charitable foundation to help other strays. By the way, that foundation still exists today. You can look it up and you can donate it. It's now in Riverside, California, and it's called the Room 8 Cat Foundation. It still exists. This stray cat who came into the room of the school looking to pillage sandwiches becomes a force for social good. He becomes known around the country, and people are donating money in his name to a charitable foundation to help other stray cats. He becomes a legitimate celebrity in Los Angeles, when he goes to the vet, the Los Angeles Times is sending a reporter along to give updates on this cat's condition. A true celebrity. It's not like they had nothing else to report on in 1964, but they're sending a reporter along with them to the vet and then a reporter to do a follow-up when he comes back from the animal hospital. And remember, all this time, all this time until the very end of his life when he suddenly becomes ill, all this time, he remains astray. What a character and what a willful character. He's living for only one thing, for children. And he remains, otherwise, he remains astray as he wants. Well, all good things must pass, including, unfortunately, very good cats. He finally dies in 1968. The first thing the school will do 
is put out a memorial issue of their newspaper dedicated to him, but they want to do something more. They pour new concrete, a new sidewalk outside the school, and anyone who wants is invited to come down and write something in the, in the wet concrete, a message to this cat that had spent 16 years at the school and who became the heart and soul of that school. If you're in Los Angeles and you love cats, I very much encourage you to go to Elysian Heights Elementary in Echo Park, the Echo Park District of Los Angeles, and walk those sidewalks because all these messages to this cat are still preserved on the sidewalk. There are pictures of him with his dates at the school, 1952 to 1968, pictures of him sitting on a desk. Some of these messages are simply written by students who had known him at the school. He slept on my desk, girl writes. Some of them are from older kids who had graduated and come back because after all, after 16 years at the school, some of these kids are in their 20s by now. We miss you, roommate. Oh, how we miss you. He came in our room and sat on my table. I loved him. Some of these are written by people who obviously have become adults, writing him little poems. They say roommate has only nine lives. Don't you believe it? Never in the hearts of happy children. This cat will live forever. But it's not just kids who are coming down and writing messages to this cat. Even newspaper reporters who had covered him are moved to come down and say a few things. A reporter from the Citizen News came down and he wrote this, roommates served above and beyond the call of duty in teaching love and kindness to children. To please and make happy were, were all were his only desires. He was loved and true. His faith never died. And of all of these messages left for him in the sidewalk, I think even though this one is so simple and I think written by a child, I think it sums it up best. He left his love, and we are blessed. Well, they'll do one more thing. And by the way, one last piece of show and tell. They gave him a little medal, the Roommate Friendship Medal, which I happen to have in my hand right now in addition to the book. He never wanted a home among humans, but they decided, God dang it, we're going to give him one now whether he wants it or not. We're going to give him a permanent home, a place of burial, a monument that will always be seen and remembered, a gravestone. So, of course, um, <laughs> a big city school in an underfunded district doesn't have enough money for an animal grave, right? So they put out a call and they said, hey, um, you know, everybody wanted to remember roommate in words. Would anyone like to remember him in cash? because we want to bury him in the Los Angeles Memorial Pet Cemetery in Calabasas. Would anyone, <clears throat> let's see, over 16 years of love and dedication, would anyone want to remember that cat with a little bit of cash? I think so. They wind up with so much money that roommate, this stray cat who came as a pillager of sandwiches, made his life at the school only wanting to be with the children and not giving a darn about anything else. This stray cat, this humble creature who found his meaning at that school, winds up with the largest grave in the entire pet cemetery, save for a couple of huge monuments for, let's say, the MGM lion. Yes, he has the largest grave in the pet cemetery, save for the darn MGM lion. This, and I understand something about the Los Angeles Memorial Pet Cemetery. Anybody who is anybody buries their pet there. Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, Diana Ross, Madonna, all the big name celebrities, this stray cat's grave outshines all of theirs. And did you know that to this day, his grave is the most visited at the Los Angeles Memorial Pet Cemetery. Now he has been dead for over half a century, yet still more people come to see his grave than any other celebrity animal. And I mean, we're talking about Valentino's dog. We're talking about animals who had been in the movies. Hop along Cassidy's horses in that cemetery, big celebrity owners and big celebrity animals, yet more people come to see this cat's grave, this humble stray cat, than any other animal in that cemetery.
And of course, they're former students. Many of them now are retirement age. They come simply to say hello to a little friend who taught them back in the days of their youth, who taught them how to love and who taught them a special lesson in affection. That's why I say that room eight is truly for me the quintessence of the American cat, the willful stray, the one born as a pillager, the one who had no prospect in life, yet found his way in making his mark on not just one human heart, but on thousands of them, and never would a better friend they find because they themselves continue to come back to that grave simply to say hello a half a century later. His story is so profound to me, and that is why, by the way, that incredible lesson in love that this cat told is why at Elysian Heights Elementary, outside of room number eight, as you can see, there is still to this day a portrait of a cat, and why outside that classroom door there will always be a portrait of a cat, because that portrait, I think truly, is the greatest portrait of an American cat that any of us will ever find. So that is the end for me. And um, Jennifer, if you're still there, uh, we can take some questions. Am I ever? My goodness. Um, okay. uh, I'm going to get out of the program and get back on your screen, Jennifer. Just close your screen share, please. And um... I will try to do that, except my screen share uh -huh, is doing an infinity thing. Is that popping up on your end? It is. Let's oh, see. that's great. How? Uh, okay, let me. Jennifer, where's my screen share? Hmm. <laughs> Not seeing it. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. We did practice all this stuff before, but these things happen. Okay. Let's just let say... me. Um. There it go. I closed. There it. Is. All right. Great. Oh, all right. Right. just on cue. Guess who's back? Oh. Baba, stay for a minute. Everybody's here because of you. Baba, nice work on this oh, book. Baba, here, play with roommate's metal. Here. No, don't play with roommate's metal. All right, I'll, I'll move this down a little so you can see her. Hi, Baba. Hi, Baba. What a beautiful cat. And thank you so much, both of you, for this wonderful evening. Um, I want to take a moment, first of all, to thank our audience for the fascinating chat. I don't think that we've ever had quite so much activity in a chat before, and it's been really fun to watch, so thank you. Um, we've also posed some wonderful questions. We clearly won't get to more than a few of them uh, because the hour is very late. I do want to remind everybody that this program has been recorded, and um, you can come back and watch it anytime you like simply by following the link uh, that you used to get here in the first place. A lot of the questions that people posed, I think, can be answered by reading this book. And uh, my friend and colleague Mallory is going to repost the link by which you can purchase this book. But I would like to say, if you want to thank Paul and the Mark Twain House for putting on this program, purchasing the book is a really good way to show um, that, that you appreciate it and enjoy. And I think everybody would be happy about that. So having said that, um, I'm going to take a, a few questions. And um, Paul, thank you. You are such a good storyteller. I think Mark Twain. I did not realize we had been at it for so long. My apologies. <laughs> it looks like we've gone on for a really long time. Well, nobody seems to mind. I sure don't. And it's been so much fun and learned so much. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead. Some, some of these questions are fantastic. And, um, you know, maybe we'll find another way to, to get them answered. But um, let's just start with, with um, one from uh, Jennifer Dertuzis. I'm sorry, Jennifer. There are so many Jennifers in the audience tonight, including myself. It's very interesting. Uh, were any attempts made to bring the cat soldiers back after World War I? After World War One, not to my knowledge, uh, I don't know. Remember, they were strays to begin with, and so they were simply released into. And they were simply released, as far as I know, they were simply released into the trenches. But also, um, um, America has a really, a really sordid history with leaving service animals in foreign countries. But let's not get into that. Okay. It's been such a fun and upbeat night. Let's not. Um, yeah. But, but uh, it, that's, that's a good point to, to be aware of. So uh, I think it would be remiss 
for us not to, um, first of all, answer a question from Mallory, uh, again, who is a friend and colleague, and she's an assistant curator oh, at the Mark Twain House. Yes, and Paul and Mallory have corresponded. She'd like to know, what's your favorite picture of Baba from the book? Hers is Baba in the pink dress with the updo. <laughs> and she well, it's funny she mentions that because that one I have stickers of, and we're going to be including some stickers of that as long as I have enough to send them out with the uh, with the book plates. So there are actually stickers of that one that we're sending out. Um, I, okay, to me, having being the photographer who took them all, the most incredible one where I really looked at that and said, "I can't believe we pulled this off," was the Napoleon Bonaparte. Well, again, folks, we're going to have to to, um, to check the book out on their own and and, check, and and decide on what your favorite is. I wanted also to bring Mallory up because, um, again, her she knows everything about Mark Twain. And uh, one of the questions is, uh, do we know the names of any of Mark Twain's cats? I'm prepared to rattle off a list of those. Uh, but another question is, what kind of cats? And I, I'm guessing just strays and... and um, you know, if they were dogs, we call them mutts. But the names, some of the names, lazy. Well, they would have been strays at that time. I'll tell you that because it was not until around, it was not until around 1900 that purebred cats really started being imported. There were very, very few of what would have been called purebred cats. They would have had to have brought into England. England had some. The United States really didn't have any. At the first cat show in Los Angeles ever, which was in the 19 in the early 20th century. Um, the big, the, the big headline attraction was the fact that they had an actual Siamese cat. So there weren't a lot of, oh, wow. there weren't, they would have been strays at that time. And, and Mallory confirms in the chat that these cats who I'll list, Lazy, Stray Kit, Abner, um, Motley, I believe, Fraulein, Buffalo Bill, Soapy Sal, Cleveland, Sour Mash, Pestilence, and Famine, Satan, and one of Satan's offspring, Sin are just some of the cats that uh, belong to, to Mark Twain and his family. And Mallory's saying, everybody look up the story of Mark Twain and his daughter, Clara's cat, Bambino, um, who learned to snuff the candle for him at night on command. That's amazing. Um, so thank you, Mallory, for your help with that. Do um, we have any more questions or? Yeah, we do. Uh, and we'll just do one or two more. Sure. Um, did you have cats as a child? Barbara wants to know. And if I did, would... um, I had a cat by the name of Fritter, as in the potato pancake type of Fritter. Um, it had been found in a dumpster. Someone had tossed it in a dumpster and was found by a girl, my neighbor, who was a, my babysitter at the time. She was an older girl. And uh, her parents would not let her keep it. And they, she brought it to my house and said, hey, maybe your son wants a cat. And that cat and I really bonded. And that apparently continued through through your life um, and is fruition now. Uh, Jillian says, where is Orangey's paw print located? Can people visit it? Great question. Um, okay, so uh, the Pats, when they had the Patsy Awards every year, they would uh, make these plaques uh, for the uh, name of the film or name of the animal, type of animal, and the paw prints. And they had this intention of uh, starting a... Uh, uh, animal Walk of Fame, like the Holly Walk of Fame, outside of, of the Chinese theater. Eventually, that plan, plan fell through. If you're in Southern California, they are all now at the Burbank Animal Shelter, or all the surviving ones are at the Burbank Animal Shelter. When you walk up towards the animal shelter, there's a row of them that leads to the front door, and those are the original Patsy Winners plaques, and oranges are there. And then off to the side, there's another row of five, and what you'll find there also um, is a, a, the paw print of a Siamese cat who won the award for, if you're familiar with the movie, Bell, Book, and Candle. So the, uh, the Siamese cat that was in Bell, Book, and Candle won one of those, so he's there also. And then in towards the back, there's a there's uh, an area of broken pavement where I guess some of the plaques may, must have gotten broken. And there's an area of broken pavement where some of them are kind of set in in mosaic. So the Burbank Animal Shelter has them. Awesome. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you for asking. And we're going to ask just one more that I think everybody's curious about. Um, how did you get your cats 
to cooperate for those photos and, and all that? Yeah, you know, okay, so that's a question that I get asked a lot and I don't, I mean, okay, I think that you need to ask her, not me, <laughs> because I can't really answer it other than she does it. To me, it's always been a kind of um, exercise in interspecies communication. You know, she was, I'll say this about her, um, she was, when I had, when I first got her, there was an older cat and then I had a younger cat come in. So she was kind of the middle child. And I think she suffered from a little bit of a middle child syndrome because, you know, the kitten's always, oh, the kitten and the older one's always the queen. And she was always very competitive for attention. And being a photographer, I was always, you know, like, like people do, I was always taking pictures of my cats. And somehow she figured out, it's like, you know what, if I do this better than the other cats, I get all the attention. And it came to a point where it's like, I love you too, but I'm just going to take some pictures with her because she really knows what she's doing. And I remember how it started one day. I put a sombrero on her and a little fake mustache and like this, this uh, box of taco shells. I was like, hey, would you do this? Like we're doing an ad or something. And she's like, sure. And it was a little paper mustache hanging down from the sombrero. I was like, I can't believe you just did that. And um, over time, it just got more and more refined. I started um, going to every doll flea market that exists because there's there are doll shows and buying up all these old doll costumes and um, uh, buying up all these old doll costumes and so forth and recutting them for her, tailoring costumes for her. Eventually, <laughs> towards the end of the book, I hired a friend of mine who was an out-of-work costume designer to custom make that samurai suit of armor and a couple of other things. So it became more and more refined over time. But ultimately, she's the only one who knows how and why she does this. Because I'll say this, a lot of times I would I would approach a photograph with a very specific type of image in mind. And she wouldn't give me what I wanted. And then I would look at the photos and it's like, every time it's like, oh yeah, you're right. That's better. How about that? I think that's a good note to end on. I know we have lots more, but uh, I think that we've taken up plenty of Paul's time and Baba's time. And uh, once again, on behalf of the Mark Twain House, I want to thank our audience for being here tonight. Thank you for your book purchases. That link is still in the chat right now. And thank you for your donations. Uh, and Paul, will you come back again, please? I think we're all hoping sure. that you'll be a regular friend of the Twain House. And Sure, there's again. a lot more we can say about cats, that's for right. sure. All right. Well, good. We hope to see you again. Thank you, everybody, for a wonderful evening. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Baba. Okay. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay.